Welcome to this biology exam preparation video where hopefully we're going to run you through some good strategies, excellent habits to get into and just make you feel that bit more confident and able to get going with your revision as we fast approach the exams. So the question we get asked most commonly by students is, you know, how, how do I start? What do I do? And the main thing you need to do, first of all, is just get yourself organised. That doesn't involve any active revision, but it's getting everything in place. And honestly, if you do it right, it will make you feel so much more confident and able to get cracking. So we're going to run you through ways to plan out your revision. We've got a timeline, we've got a blank timetable uh, that will be uploaded to Teams, etc. that I can talk you through. Then it's all about actually what you need to revise, you know, thinking about what it is that you actually need to be able to do when it comes to the exam. And then finally, we're going to finish off with some really good, effective revision techniques. So this is just a screenshot of a document that Mr. Crow has made, which is a fantastic timeline um, on what you can approach as we get up to those final few weeks. So there is a 16 week plan and an eight week plan to see where you're up to. And basically it's running through each week, what sort of booklets you can revise, which booklets you can work back through, and also what you're gonna be doing in lessons at the same time. So it gives you a really good feel for whether you're still learning new content or not, and what kind of topics will work in well with it so which ones will marry up together so for example you know if it's the week beginning the 8th of May then we will be doing revision by that point in lessons so you know that you've got time to revise there but things that you could be revising it suggests that if you're doing the 16 week plan, you might be looking at the upper sixth booklet five and also having a little look back over the lower sixth booklet six and upper sixth booklet three. Or if you're on the eight week plan to look at upper sixth booklet three and upper sixth booklet four. So it's just really good to have a bit of a plan of what order to do things in. So then often a big one is, right, I know this week I need to be revising whatever topic it may be, but yeah, how do I factor that into my week? So this is a blank revision timetable, which you can use, fill in um, as you please and as you see fit. And it's one that you can use for all your subjects. It's just planning out your week and breaking it into little chunks and thinking about how much of your week needs to be spent studying and revising and how much you can spend doing your own thing, relaxing, recuperating, working, whatever it is that you want to spend your downtime doing. One of the big benefits of this is it's nice to know when you have factored in you time so that when you are not studying, not revising, you feel that you can properly relax because you don't have it looming over you. You're not sitting there trying to, you know, watch a film or catch up with your friends feeling guilty that you should be revising you know that you've worked it out and this is time for you so if you look at this we've got the morning afternoon and evening divvied up into roughly uh, three one hour slots so morning is one session afternoon is one session and an evening is one session so really in the space of a week you've got 21 sessions 21 morning afternoon evening blocks so the idea is really you should aim to make 14 of those study sessions. Okay, that's about 42 hours a week. Sounds like loads, doesn't it? But really that should be time that you set aside to revise, to do college work, so your lessons, and also to do homework, okay? And then in amongst that, factor in and, and block out seven sessions for you, whatever it is that you want to be doing. It's it's you time, it's not studying time. Um, and the thing is you can make this so that it's the same every week, so that you always do, you know, biology on a Tuesday evening and you always give yourself a whole Saturday off. Or you can have different ones every week. Depends on what works for you. So here's an example of a sort of filled in one where you can see um, the yellow blocks are college commitments, so college lessons, tutorial, RE, etc. The green blocks are additional study sessions, so that will be revision time or getting on with homework, etc. And then the white blocks are your you time. So I've put Monday morning, Tuesday afternoon, all day Saturday, Friday evening, Sunday evening or for you, whether you're working, playing, whatever it is that works for you. And I think all of you will find that that is a really good way um, for you to feel in control and also properly switch off when you aren't studying. 
So thinking about the actual exam itself, knowing what you're expected to do in each exam paper really helps you to prepare and feel in control. And that's a really important part of this. You need to feel in control. Um, it will make you feel much calmer and much more confident. So there are three exam papers in biology. Hopefully you know this by now. And what we're going to do is just run through what's in each paper, how long they last, so that you know what you are preparing for. So paper one, the first one, that is only going to be asking you questions on the lower sixth topics. So that's your lower sixth booklets one to eight and any of the associated required practicals and math skills, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So it's a two hour paper and it's worth 91 marks. OK, so you know how long you're going to be there and you know roughly how much it's worth. OK, so at the end of a paper one, there are usually three longer questions and they can be between four and six marks, so about 15 marks in total. OK, so be prepared for those bigger ones. If you like, remember, you don't have to do the paper in a specific order. If you want to get those big ones done at the beginning, that makes you feel calmer. Head to the back of the paper, do them at the beginning. OK. That's a really good thing to do if they loom for you so that you know that you're not going to have to get towards the end and worry about running out of time to get them done, get them out of the way at the beginning. So paper two, that is only upper sixth content, so your year 13 work. So that's your upper sixth booklets one to six and any of the practicals, math skills that are relevant to those. Again, it's another two hour paper, okay? And this one has a comprehension question in it. So you'll have to read maybe a paragraph or two and then about 15 marks worth of questions about that, okay? Really, it's about reading that information. Don't skim it, because what people do is they think, oh, I can't be bothered reading all that. I'll just get to the questions. But make sure you know what's been written down, because a lot of the answers are written in there. My old school, secondary school comprehensions, don't ignore that passage. If you read it properly, there are some easy marks to be had. And finally, paper three. So paper three is your mix. So that has questions on everything. So upper sixth and lower sixth, okay? And any of the practicals and the math skills. So it's knitting it all together at the end. It's a two hour paper, but it has fewer marks in it. So it's 78 marks. And this is the one that includes the essay, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later on, okay? There's usually about 15 marks worth of questions on scientific investigation, sort of skills, data, graphs, etc. okay? So it is, one that is um, sometimes difficult to time manage because you've got lots of things that you've got to read and interpret like graphs and data and obviously you've got your essay in there as well so it's really important by the time you get to paper three that you're good and confident with your time management okay so on to some specific biology top tips. So these have been put together by Mr. Crow and they are in a little Word document that we've sent out to you as well. But hopefully if you just keep these in mind, it will make you much more prepared for the exam. So being smart about the exams and how they're comprised and what's required in all of them. So key one to start off with is don't neglect the maths. So we know that the maths demand is about 10% across the three papers, so 10% of the biology qualification. Don't panic if maths is not your absolute best buddy, okay? There are plenty of marks that you can get even if you are not a complete maths whiz, okay? So don't waste stages if you know it's something that you're not going to get right. Often it's only a couple of marks, okay? I know that sounds dreadful, but don't go down a rabbit hole for a calculation that you, you know you're not going to get right, okay? If maths is something that makes you quite anxious, again, do the maths questions first, get them out of the way, okay? Because often if you leave it to the end and you're aware that time is running out, then it makes it more stressful. You end up getting into a bit of a blind panic. So get them done, just get them out of the way, okay? So another thing to always think about is, there's nearly always a mark for a bit of working out, including the right kind of number or the right equation. So it's always worth just jotting a bit of something down and seeing if you might just get a mark for it anyway. The practical investigation, so required practicals. You do not need to know the practicals 
have memorized them by heart. It's not going to be like, you know, what are the steps in doing the Benedict's test? You know, you don't have to know the volumes of reagent use or anything like that. OK, usually it's about the principles behind it, how you control it, how you um, interpret results, etc. But it is worth 15 percent and it's not something that you should ignore. Stats. OK, there is always going to be a stats based question coming up. Nothing awful though, we don't have to calculate stats. What you need to be able to do is interpret the results of them and also know which stats test to choose. So you've got in your maths booklet, a little uh, flowchart that shows you when to pick which one. And then really it's all down to things like p-values, knowing what a p-value is and how to interpret it. So remember that the p stands for probability due to chance okay so we use 0.05 or 5 percent as our cutoff so we say you know, if the p value the probability due to chance is less than 5 percent 0.05 then that's really not much due to chance if i love my words there so we're going to say that the difference is significant for that one if it's greater than five percent so if the p value is greater than five percent the probability of the difference in the results being due to chance is greater than five percent then that we're going to say is oh, it's too much we're not going to say that that's a significant difference there so just make sure you know what a p-value actually is and that five percent or 0.05 as a decimal is our cutoff level okay the other really important one is knowing about your standard deviation bars and what it means if they overlap or they don't overlap they love to give graph information with the bars drawn on and then people ignore the bars if they overlap we're saying that the differences are not significant okay so if they're overlapping not significant must be due to chance if they don't overlap then we're saying the differences must be significant they're not due to chance it's all about the overlap okay key thing here and you know people always fall foul of this is to remember it's not your results that are significant it's the difference in the results if you don't say the difference between the results you won't get the mark okay so you've got to keep thinking that difference significant difference is significant or difference is not significant okay evaluation questions right these are a big one and if you follow our handy little mnemonic you can get an awful lot of marks very easily for an evaluation question so we know that across the papers is roughly about 25 marks available for evaluation so if you learn this properly and i'll show you on the next slide about it it's easy peasy okay so let's have a little look at what to consider when you get an evaluation question so when you evaluate look at and see whether you can comment on any of these following statements okay so the mnemonic we like to use but you can make your own is dominant strikers can score decent goals so that's data stats control subjects duration and generalization you can't necessarily talk about all of them but this is your starting point when you are evaluating something it could be a statement it could be some data so run through that list in your head and think right can i make a comment about the data does it support or does it not support the stats have they included stats have they done stats if they haven't done stats you can comment on it you can say well they've not done a stats test i don't know if those um differences in results are significant or not if they have done a stats interpret them have they got overlapping error bars what's the p value controls have they included controls in it if they haven't included a control that's a negative that you can comment on if they have included a control is it a decent control is it a valid one subjects are there um, enough of them is it a big enough sample size who are the subjects you know is it just done on mice so can you generalize it to humans etc um are they all one gender are they all a particular age group so on and so forth so are they representative of a whole population or of who you're thinking about duration how long was the study for do you know the long-term effects of the study whether there are side effects so on and so forth and then finally generalization if you're given something like you know a journalist has concluded that this drug cures all cancer 
have they gone beyond the study? So you know, famously, they'll do things like show you a study on a drug affecting breast cancer, and then it'll say, like, a journalist said that this drug is effective in treating cancer. Well, that's a generalisation. If the results are only about breast cancer, you can't go talking about all cancers, can you? So is there a bit of that in there? So you can pick your way through, and that's a whole load of things that you can talk about that you will get easy marks for. So don't um, overlook that. Put the work in and make sure you memorise um, either that mnemonic, dominant strikers can score decent goals, or make up your own for those statements. Never underestimate the importance of reading and understanding exactly what it is the question is wanting from you. So this is what we refer to as being the command words in the question. And it's just making sure that you're not skimming over them and not really taking on board exactly what the question is asking you. So quite often, for example, with a describe question where you are just saying what you can see or describing a structure, etc., there isn't a backup to it. There's no need for any reasoning or explanation to it. Whereas for an explain one, you need to come up with the reasons for. Now, often people muddle these two up. So there are many times where a question will say, explain the whatever it may be. And then people go into detail describing it, but there's no reasoning behind it. So make sure that you don't fall into that trap um, and that you are making sure you know exactly what it is that you need to be saying so that you are describing for describe questions, explaining for explain questions. And then we move on to the um, slightly less straightforward ones. So compare and contrast. So obviously, if you're comparing, you're looking at the similarities. The key with that is talk about both of them. OK, so if you're comparing DNA and RNA, don't just say, oh, DNA is made of nucleotides and assume that your examiner knows that even though you've not said it, you are somehow stating that RNA also has nucleotides, you have to spell it out. So when you are comparing things, talk about both of them. Same with when you are contrasting things. So a contrast is when you're looking at the differences. Again, both sides of the same coin. One has this feature, but the other has that feature. So if it's in a table or if it's just an extended response type one, you need to be talking about both of them at the same time, okay? Evaluate, we've just been through that. So that's the one where you're going to look at things like the data, the subjects, whether it's generalised, stats, control, all of that. So hopefully that's a bit easier now. And then the last one, I think, which sometimes worries people is a suggest one. So the, the thing with that is it's not... It's not a question where you've been taught an exact answer. It's wanting you to use the things that you know already well from the biology spec to come up with a suggestion, an idea, a bit of a thought. Don't panic about them. You've just got to sort of use your knowledge to make like an educated sort of proposal to it. OK, but do make sure if you're somebody that gets a bit um, overwhelmed in exams and, you know, you, you find yourself going a bit sort of word blind when you're reading it. Feel free to underline the command word or highlight it and just get it really clear in your head exactly what it is that you are answering and needing to say to get the marks. So moving on from command words and then the language, making sure that you are using that right terminology when you are answering. So you're using A-level biology language to answer your questions. So we know that there are so many big exciting terms in um, biology and we quite often abbreviate them to small ones but you need to make sure that you are using the abbreviations appropriately so there are some abbreviations you can absolutely use and you can always use them so they're listed in this table ATP, ADP, DNA, RNA, mRNA, tRNA, RNAi, cRNA, HIV, AIDS, ELISA, NAD, FAD, NADP, FADP, uh, Ruby P, GP, all of these you're absolutely fine to use. You don't have to explain what they mean, you can just use the abbreviation. Anything else, things like, don't ask me why, but TP for triosphosphate, um, APC, RER and SER for the endoplasmic reticulum, you can't use those. Also remember, don't be talking about the letters for um, the nucleotides, don't be talking A, T, C's and G's in an answer use their names, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, they aren't appropriate either. So just make sure you know those ones. If in doubt, write it out in full and then 
put the abbreviation in brackets afterwards so that you've definitely got the proper one in there. So you're kind of covering both sides there. And then moving on to proper terminology, you can't use um, some of the phrases that you might use in secondary school. And you can't really use everyday sort of chat language. You definitely mustn't use slang. You've got to use the specific terminology from the A-level biology spec. Um, so remember, things like shape is not the same as a tertiary structure, okay? If you say shape instead of tertiary structure, you will not get the mark. If you're chatting to your pal about it, it might make sense to say shape, um, but technically it's wrong. Um, it's not the right phrase. Don't use it, okay? Things like complementary, active sites, only talk about those if it's enzymes. It's that sort of thing. It's not muddling up the words and using them in the wrong places, and it's not using sort of basic language when there's a proper biological term for it. So just making sure that you're hot on that. And then the, the final sort of piece to the puzzle of the exam papers is the essay. And it's one of those things where lots of people feel really um, anxious about the essay, but honestly view it as a fantastic opportunity for you to get a lot of marks and a lot of credit for things that you know and you know well. Uh, we do lots of work on essays, you've had practice with them. But the way I always describe it or explain the essay is that it is deliberately vague. The title choices you get mean that there are so many things that you can talk about. And the key thing here is you get to pick what you talk about and what you don't talk about. So you pick whichever title is going to cover the things that you are most confident in and then just talk about the things that you're confident in. OK, and um, so, for example, you know, if you've got a title and you could talk about I don't know, um, PCR in it, but you're not that confident on PCR, don't talk about it. Pick another one. You only really need four paragraphs for a, a good quality essay. Um, don't panic too much about trying to get loads in there. Four good, solid paragraphs. So four good chunks relevant to the title. Um, what I would say about it is if you've ever done loads of revision for things and then come to sit a test or an exam and you've not been asked questions on it and you felt really fed up because you feel like there are certain topics that you could have absolutely nailed, often the essay is your time to shine because you usually will have some opportunity linked to that title where you can talk about things that you are really good at and you can get the marks for it. So view it that way rather than, oh, it's a big scary essay. Um, view it as an opportunity for you to shine with the things that you're confident in okay don't be tempted to add extra content in as it says here don't be tempted to add a fifth paragraph that's a little bit sketchy because you could lose marks there you could lose marks for incorrect uh, content or not being overly relevant so as i say at the basic um, or at a base you should just aim for four good quality paragraphs okay nice solid use your terminology well explain it well um, and it is it's a great opportunity to get an awful lot of marks so now you know how to organize yourself so you know when you're going to revise and you've got your timeline so you know what booklets what topics to revise and you're got your eye on the actual exam papers that you know you know about the maths and the stats and the you know the kind of questions and what the papers are like in terms of what kind of questions they comprise of now getting into the nitty-gritty of actually revising so your study skills which again is something that you know people don't necessarily feel confident in so what I'm going to do here is just run you through some top tips for actually revising and studying when it comes to biology so any psychologist amongst you will probably be kind of familiar with this, but you need to think about your memory and, and how it actually works, because really revising and preparing for exams is largely down to your memory. So you need to remember that in order to put information into your short term memory, you need to be paying attention to it. So passively taking things on board doesn't really work. OK, so this is really important when you're in lessons or you're working um, on new information, really, really try to engage with it properly. OK, in order to sort of keep it in your short term memory, but also transfer it to get it locked into your long term memory, rehearsal is really key. So it's the idea of being able to go over it 
again and again. So this is kind of like the idea of revising, like returning to it, okay? In order to fully remember something, so to be consciously aware of it, you have to drag it out of your long-term memory and put it back into your short-term memory so you can actually sort of be aware of it. And that's called retrieval. So that's being able to actually pluck it out of storage and use it and remember it. So we'll talk a bit about retrieval practice, okay? Any failure in these sort of processes can lead to you forgetting things or not really having a secure memory of them, okay? So we wanna be working on these processes so that you've got really strong, confident memories and that when you're in an exam, they are gonna come back to you nice and clearly. So mnemonics are a great way to try and organise new information and make it easy to remember because you're tying it into something that you sort of already know about. Um, so they're really handy in things like biology. We have quite a few sort of lists or lots of steps or lots of processes that you could easily turn into a mnemonic. Um, you've got a lovely one here that we can all use because it is relevant to the spec. So dear Katie, please come over for great soup. So that's domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And it just tends to make it that bit easier. So this one's quite an interesting one, and I think it, it's a bit of fun. So what we know is that if you are in the same context, which means the same sort of environment, when you learn information as when you remember it, you do much better. So there was a, a little study done where they got divers to learn um, words, basically. So they got some divers to learn words on dry land and some to learn words underwater. And then what they did was they got the divers to either remember or recall, so write down the words they'd learned from memory in the same place. So if they learned it on the dry land, they remembered it on the dry land, dry land. Or if they learned it underwater, they had to remember it underwater. So they gave half them that, and then the other half, they made them recall it in a different environment. So they learned it underwater, but then had to remember it on the dry land, or they learned it on the dry land and had to remember it underwater. And it was really interesting because what they found was if you remember something in the same context, so like environment, as you learnt it, your memory is much, much better. Now, what this means really is that you should sit your final exams in your normal classroom because then the context is the same. But um, in reality, we, we can't do that. But what you can think about is um, when you are revising, are there any cues you can give yourself that will trick your brain into thinking you are back in your sort of revision zone or your revision area? OK. So this can be a little sort of memory hack. OK, so as I say, I'm not suggesting you go underwater or anything like that. But what you can do is you can use things like smell and sound to try and help you jolt your memory back. So if you're revising in you know, your room or in the dining room, wherever it is that you revise, what you can do is you can pick a brand new sort of smell for that area so you might be like when i revise biology in my room you might get like a body spray or a perfume or a essential oil and make sure that when you're revising it sort of smells of that and the idea is that then when you go into the exam you can put a little bit of that smell on your sleeve or on your wrist and then when you get into the exam you can sniff your sleeve or your wrist and that smell we you know smells really um powerful at evoking memories hopefully when you smell it in the example it will trick your memory sort of jolt it back to when you were revising and just give you a little bit of a memory boost uh, another thing you could do is you could listen to music when you revise i'm going to caveat this heavily if you listen to music when you revise make sure it doesn't have lyrics if it has lyrics you'll end up singing along or thinking about the words or whatever it may be so try and pick instrumental music um, but again, on the way into the exam, stick it on your headphones, listen to it, get it stuck in your head for the exam. Again, it will it will give your memory just a little bit of a jolt. I definitely did it for my GCSEs, my A-levels and my degree. It might all be psychosomatic, but I felt like it made me feel more confident with my memory, definitely. So let's have a little think about different learning techniques. So we've got here just 10 of the most like common learning techniques, things that most students tend to do. So you've got 
Number one, elaborative interrogations. That's when you are busy explaining something, like all of the um, reasons behind it. Two, self-explanation. So trying to sort of um, link it to things you already know, explain it to yourself. You might, you know, draw a comparison between something new that you're learning and like, I don't know, a recipe for something. So trying to make it make sense to you. Summarising things, highlighting and underlining, that's a big one for lots of people. Mnemonics, as we were just talking about. Uh, imagery, so trying to like form um an image in your head of, of what it is that you are trying to remember, rereading, so going back over things, testing yourself, quizzing, distributed practice, which is when you sort of spread out the studies that you are doing. So you're not just focusing on one sort of booklet for a week that you're switching up. Uh, and interleaving is where you switch it up, but you keep sort of coming back to things as well. So you're, you're in a revision session, you might um, start with one thing and then move on to something a bit different and then on to something a bit different again. So interleaving and distributing are sort of similar ideas where you're scheduling your practice in a way that spreads it out and mixes it up a little bit. So have a little bit of a think about those techniques I've just been through and which are the main ones that you tend to do because they're the most common ones are the ones that most people do but which are the ones that you as an individual are most likely to hit when you start revising so of those 10 techniques which are actually the decent ones that you should be focusing on so what we know is that from research Practice testing, so lots of quizzing and distributed practice are really, really effective techniques. So they're ones that you should really try and incorporate. Moderately good ones are things like elaborative interrogation, so that really going into the depth and, and talking about it. Self-explanation, like finding ways to make it make sense to you and that interleaved practice. And then sadly, the least effective ones are probably some of the most common ones. Things like summarising um, what you've learned, highlighting is a really dodgy one because a lot of people just highlight everything. Uh, mnemonics as an overall strategy, if you were to try and make everything into a mnemonic, it isn't going to work. So mnemonics work for the odd thing, but not for everything. Imagery and rereading. And as I say, a lot of people do that. They do rereading, summarising and highlighting as huge um, mainstays of their revision. So just to give you a bit of um, an idea here, interleaved practice, so as I said, distributed and interleaved, they're sort of mixing it up um, when you're advising. Research has shown that when you actually do tests, interleaved uh, studying is much, much more effective. So that's something to bear in mind when you are thinking about how you're approaching your studying. So testing yourself, self-testing, it's really, really good. So you could do things like um, read things through, make yourself flashcard quizzes and questions. We've got Quizlet quizzes for you. You can sign in and register with Kahoot. There are lots of pre-made things on there as well. You can quiz each other. It's just a really good technique. Hopefully you do lots of quizzing um, in lessons as well. You know, teachers ask you lots and lots of quick fire sort of questions just to keep it fresh. Distributed practice, big one, I mean, hugely important. So this is about getting yourself organised and going back to that timeline and the revision uh, timetable, that's really going to help you with distributed practice. Um, so make sure that you are doing that um, because cramming feels like it's effective. But what we know is that when you cram, you only remember for a very short period of time. and It doesn't really stick with you and there isn't that depth to it. Um, so you can do some cramming, but make sure that that is the last thing that you do, that in between when you've been doing the weeks and weeks up to the exams, you've been doing distributed practice because that's probably the key to it. So lots of distributed practice and then by all means have a bit of a cram right at the end. Key thing, highlighters. Lovely in a way, um, but they can just make you highlight everything, in which case they're completely useless. So you have to be very, very discerning and selective when you highlight things. So maybe put the highlighter down. <laughs> so in terms of a, a strategy for you when you're going through topics, three key steps to it. And this is all based on that research. So step one is, is synthesising, and I'll talk to you more about that in a second. 
Step two is about reorganizing and condensing the information. And then step three is about sort of practicing properly. So distributing your practice, having to go at uh, exam questions, but you know, distributing it, spreading it out. So synthesis is about pulling everything together and putting it in one place. Now we do that for you in biology, really. Your notes are everything you need to know, nice and snappy in one booklet, okay? So we've kind of done things for you. We've taken all the kind of bits and bobs and put it into a booklet. Reorganizing, this is part of the, the middle steps. So putting it into your own words, um, you can make imagery, posters, tables, um, taking it and making it very bespoke to you. Okay, it's really important not just to copy out your notes booklet because that's completely pointless. You might as well be a photocopier if you do that. So you use colour, use diagrams, summarise things into tables. Condensing and recondensing, making it smaller and snappier. Okay, if you can take a load of information and get it onto little flashcards, brilliant. Okay, so the key thing here is don't just rewrite everything. This is a good opportunity where you could maybe use something like mnemonics or chunking just to really get it short and snappy. And then finally, get on with your practicing. So this is your quizzing, this is your testing, using things like your um, homework books for questions. Um, the fact that there are so many past papers on the AQA website that you can dip in and out of and you can again, you can use these resources and you distributed practice with them so you can spread it out um, and have a go. And this is all also, you know, retrieval practice as well. And if you've got to this point, then well done. I know that that's an awful lot of information, but use this video to flick through it, fast forward through to the bits that are most important to you and just use this as a starting point for you to make your own beautifully bespoke revision plan of attack. So get yourself organised, make sure you know exactly what it is that you need to be focusing on and then implement some of those really successful strategies that we've talked about, the ones that research have shown are really going to work for you. Um, without being horribly cliche, it's about working smarter, not harder. We don't want you chaotically writing out entire booklets and highlighting everything under the sun. You need to be balancing yourself, organising yourself and feeling confident and in control. Uh, and obviously, you know, talk, talk to us as your teachers. We can help to support you if there's anything that you're not sure about. But now is the time to get cracking. Um, and if you follow those steps, you should find yourself feeling much more settled and motivated towards the exams. And good luck.